Hello and welcome to episode number 70 of the Dragons Are Real podcast. I'm your host, Pete Jones. So, um, as you may or may not know, that's all of my audio podcasts get also posted on YouTube, which opens up to another audience. And I had a suggestion by one of my YouTube subscribers, somebody known as Hellbent, who said, Could I suggest a topic for ICRPG for you? What about you cover the settings, in particular warp shell, in a detailed way? That could way be interesting. And this was further added to by Colin Sinclair, one of my face-to-face group, who said, I'm also going to second that thought, a review of each of the worlds, just like the Blood and Snow episode. Also, your thoughts on the impact of the changes to the implied settings. Well, guys, I think that's a good idea, so let's have a look at this. Uh, as Colin said, uh, Blood and Snow, I've covered before. So if you want to hear that, that's in episode 58 and check it out in my back catalogue. So this mini series, I'm going to cover the official worlds and settings in ICRPG, which are Alfine, Warp Shell, Ghost Mountain, Altered State and Vigilante City. So in this episode, we're going to look at the fantasy setting Alfine. So Alfheim first appeared in the core second book as a world primer. And the way Hank did this, that we have uh, nine classes for the uh, to create your characters. There's five bioforms. And then at the back of the book, we've got a world primer, which gives us some snippets of information to get us going. So what is Alfheim? So Alfheim resides in a fragment dimension beyond the Frost Realms, nearer to the mortal coil than the elemental planes. What he tells us is it's a young world, only a few thousand years have passed here, and there have been two epochs, the Age of Serpents, which ended a thousand years ago, and we have the Age of the Falcon. Now why the Age of Serpents and the Snake Men that ruled that epoch um, how they met their end, nobody knows, um, because dwarves, men and small folk are poor historians and little is known of past, about the past five centuries. So it's a little snapshot of what Alfheim is, but in that little snapshot, what have we learned? Well, we learned that snake men used to be a thing, but they are no more, and why nobody knows. And that we know that dwarves, men and small folk all appear in this setting. And what um, then follows in the world primer is a list of several locations. Each of these locations has a short paragraph which explains what that location is about. And each of the locations has three adventure seeds to get players up and running. Now, I'm not going to run through all of these adventure seeds and all of these locations, but what I'm going to try and do is give an overview of what we know about this world and look at how the classes and the bioforms um, help sort of shape this world. But that what Hank's done is there's there's detail here, a little detail, not too much, enough detail to spark your imagination. And then it's then for the GM and the players to build on this. And I love these sort of uh, setting notes. I'm not ones for 60 pages of settings that I've got to read through as GM. Um, I want some bullet points with some ideas and that can get me going. So before we get on to what we know, else we know about this world, let's look at the five bioforms you can play as a player. A bioform is what in the 70s we would know as a race. So you can be elf kind, dwarf, small folk, human and hill folk. And in these short descriptions, it lets us know a little bit, a little snapshot of what these five bioforms are about. For example, humans were once the dominators of the land are now a dwindling race searching for a king. Hell folk are sort of thick boned, who are sort of the kin of bears and wolves, keepers of the wild, and are tall. Small folk are little people who are descended from the first men and holders of true goodness. 
Dwarves live in the mountain ranges and are kings of solid rock. And the elf are from the age of immortals who are beautiful and graceful, but tainted with a legacy of betrayal. And as you can see from that, that is all we know about those five races. So it leaves loads of scope open for what we as players and GMs can sort of add to that. And it's an ideal opportunity that we're in a situation and we're not sure as a GM, we can say to one of the players, well, you're a small folk. What do the small folk think of this? And it gets a, a chance for the players to add to the narrative, add to the story, and gets, maybe get some hooks from the players that you can add to your game. So there are nine classes for Alfheim. We have Guardian and Blade, which are your fighters. Shadow, which is your roguey type. Archer, who is your long distance shooter. A priest, who is your holy man. A scout, who is your light troops, your um, ranger type. A mage, who's your magician. A commander, who is either a noble or ex-military. And finally, we have a wilding, which is someone that lives out in the countryside. And the way these nine classes are done is each of them has some recommended gear and a starter reward and the recommended gear and the starter reward help define the class of character i mean you can play it any way you want to but with if you take the recommended gear then that gives you your your flavor for the character and uh, for the for that class and each of the classes has a, a, a number of milestone rewards which again sort of emphasizes that class of character so if you're a mage and it's certain spells and uh, mag magical stuff that adds to your character class so it's very clever the way it's done um hank is a genius sometimes you know we, we haven't got pages and pages of this we've got little snippets and each of these little snippets sort of adds to it but it allows you as a player and as a gm to add to this so what do we know about the world? Well, as I said, there's several locations here and each of them has a paragraph. Um, we know that there's uh, main continents and we know that there's islands. We know that there's cities. Um, we know that there's mountains. And through these paragraphs, we learn little snippets of information about the world. So for example, we know that uh, there is a Norse throne that is shared by three dire warlords. Uh, we know that there's an ancient race of people that were once savages and who now live in a cave network, and these are called primals, um, and they sort of like a, a, a warrior type. We know that there is a race called Iradium Dwarves that live in the mountains and who have secret vaults. We also know that there is an ancient uh, serpent kingdom, and we have a couple of locations where these kingdoms were once um, existing, there's the Tomb of Snakes, which is an ancient ruined city, which has got paved causeways and blasphemous inhuman pyramids. But again, all these little, all this flavour comes through in this book, but there's not not too much detail, which which I really like. Um, there is a tribe of desert elves that look overlook a gorge, and what is in this gorge? Well, nobody knows. It's a sort of an endless pit that no one knows what it's about. We have um, a city of Gilhelm, which is a port. And from this port, there are trade routes with other lands. Uh, there are jagged rocks and sort of, um, islands which are treacherous and many ships have been lost. Um, we've got sort of ancient wonders that, that exist, sort of with marble, marble paved plazas and towering colonnades. Uh, that were a monument, but what they about? We're not sure. It's from one of the previous epochs. We have the Kingdom of Zenus, which is an island full of obelisks. It's one of the oldest places in the land, and it's sort of festooned with bizarre stone shapes and alien st structures. And people that go there don't return. And then two hundred leagues away, we have a titanic wall of Durus. Um, why was that wall built? Well, we don't know. So as you can see from the core book, we have these locations and we have got little snippets of information. Uh, all we know about this place is that there was a previous epoch um, that possibly there has been alien life on the planet. Um, why it came to Alfheim, no one knows. So there's that is 
what we have from the core book. So next off, we're going to look at what the world's book adds to Alfheim. So whereas in the core book, we had nine pages of information on Alfheim, in the world supplement, we have got 40 plus pages of information on Alfheim, which adds to core. And it starts off with a map of Alfheim. We have a large continent, um, which with several kingdoms in, we've got some islands off to the left. And some of these places that we've mentioned in the previous core book now appear on this map, like the Isles of Aya, the uh, Isles of Xenos. Uh, so now we've got a setting uh, map. Um, again, it is not fully fleshed out. Uh, just the, uh, it's a black map with white borders and it says, not every detail is shown on the Alfheim map. For one thing, knowledge of the world is not total in the Age of Kingdoms. And another, those blank spaces and the map dungeons offer you and your players to discover. Uh, this is the point where we mentioned that there's no single theme tying Alfheim together. It isn't dark or high or low fantasy, but a, comp a complex fabric of flavours. And this is very clever because this allows you to play the type of uh, fantasy world that you want to play, um, as opposed to tying you into a, a grim and dark uh, setting or a, a high fantasy setting. You can determine how it's played. And the other thing I like about this is you can also play different types of games within the same setting so if you've got a series of sessions that you want to play high fantasy you can do so then by moving whether it be through portals or land travel you can travel to a completely different setting within the, the same world so that's really clever and then what um, we get in Alfheim is each one of these continents is broken down each one of them gets a two or three page spread and there's a sort of a, a map of the area, a, a very loose map, but a little bit more de detail. So like sort of areas, maybe a city. And each of these gets um, the same setup where you have the lay of the land. You have dangers to dare. You have details to discover, folk and friendship and dungeons to, to dwell and any more information that is deemed necessary. So what does this tell, tell us? Well, we've got Aya, which is the domain of the primals, and it's sort of uh, rocky highlands, lots of storms, and the primals occupy this land somewhere in the northern snows. So we've got winter continents as well. There's giant beasts, there's slavers, and there's an icy wind that moves through the area of Aya. Then south of Aya, we've got the Iradium, which is the kingdom of heroes, where any man or woman may rule if they deserve. It's bountiful, pleasant land with kingly roads, and there are dwarves living here. So that is our second kingdom. Then we move on to the mainland where we have Ket, which is the Desert of Bones. It's lonely and it's cold steppes and it's very deadly. We have a high desert. We have nomadic folk with brigands uh, wandering around. So a dangerous, lawless place, possibly. Then we move on to Kath, the Tomb of Snakes. With the Dune Sea, we have sweltering jungles. It's inhabited. You can die of thirst. There are undead lurking around and the serpent folk used to reside there. Are they still there? Who knows? Then we move on to Nordheim, the Endless Woods, a large forested kingdom where true pioneers live up north. There's master shipbuilders and keepers of dark, violent secrets. We have vast forests. We've got shipping. There's patrolled roads. Then we have Aethos, the island fortress of elf kind, which is held in a magic power. There's shrouded isles, there's weird calm, there's sort of like a, a grey veil um, covering the islands, hiding them, uh, and there's ancient wealth in the place. Then we have the grey, the heart of Alfheim, a vast diverse kingdom, riven by the, uh, the defiant hellfolk 
of Numidia. So it's a land of many borders. It butts onto many of the other kingdoms. There's a vast fortress, largest city fortress in Alfheim. Um, there's law and order. It's pleasant. And there's ancient forests. Then we move on to the Numidia, the feral highlands, where elk, wolves and men commune as one of those remote desolate stones. So it's a rocky highland, untamed wilderness, a frigid wind with spiked walled borders. Then we move on to the Deadlands, a poisoned, cloying hell of ebony muck and rot. Dark forces take seed and the land cannot heal. There's noxious swamps, razor thistles, sinking lands, and the charred wall on both sides of the kingdom. Is that to keep people out, or is it to keep people in? And then we move on to Xenos. Xenos, the star fallen. The stones in Xenos are children of some faraway star, or a time long before our own sun was born. With colossal jade and basalt blocks, mind-defying angles, it's a natural, there's doorways, there's shifting shapes, it's all alien there. Then we have the Greenway. There are yet good and simple folks in our world, and they hold fast all that is best in life. There's hills and dales, there's farmlands, there's uh, his history there, and it's a rainy season, which is the land of the Greenway. Then we have Thussum, the goblin stronghold, what most consider to be a vile folk, in fact a noble, honourable and hilarious race. We have hinterlands, we have a great wall, we have barrows, and it's all up there in that location of Thussum. Then we have Scar, the realm of beasts. Myriads of wild things roam the wide plains and plateaus of Scar, and they all want to eat you. It's a scoured land... Uh, with high deserts, old bones, and ceaseless winds. Then we have Durdin, the fortress of a dwarf kind, a great and sprawling land that stands as the indomitable capital of all the kingdoms of Alfheim. It's a land of many climates, as molten mountains, a mighty city, a large wall, an under kingdom, endless coasts, big, large kingdom. Then we have Olo, a frozen hell. None dare the ice hells of Olo, for they are dead, for they are the dead realm of Manic and grave to any who dares the snows. It's a frozen land with glaciers, a large castle, salt frost, plains. And then we get to the end of the world, which is Krask World's End. Here is your place to create. Is it an evil stronghold? A last bastion of good? a dimensional fold or climatic anomaly. All doors are open. And that one, uh, we know there's a, a, a landmark, which is a castle. It's mysterious. And that's for you to add to. And then following all this, we have a slightly more detailed map, which covers all of the sort of minor maps put together, um, putting all the kingdoms on the map. So as you can see, we've got a load of kingdoms there, which um, have each of them has got a description of what it is some adventure seeds and it really is a, a very clever designed uh, fantasy setting because as i said before you can run whatever type of adventure you want in there um, any sort of um, any style because you have each of these kingdoms which is so very different and you can travel between them so if you want to mix in uh, your genres of fantasy you can do so and throw your players so that was the world setting. So finally, we're going to have a look at the Quick Start 2E to see what that adds to Alfheim. So in the Quick Start 2nd edition, we have Alfheim, an Age of Kingdoms, which in the remote corner of the cosmos, a little planet called Earth, spelt U-R-T-H, is orbited by a shattered moon called Ironheart. The nations of this blue world rise and fall. The largest continent here is Alfheim. So this is the first time that we know, besides Alfheim, there are other continents. It's somewhere between the quiet of the primordial days and the smoke of the age of the machine it rests, where magic and mystery still holds its place. And this is where we introduce a new race, the star-faring Tordents, who have brought this world into the cosmic conflict. 
and we have six facts that are known by all people across the realms of Alfine. So again, this is now adding to our knowledge of the world. King Henrik is missing. A Radrum has been destroyed. Goblins have joined mankind. Snow Orcs have organised. Elves have taken Scar and Torton refugees have arrived. So we're now adding to what we learned from the two of us two previous books uh, we're adding to the law of the land but again each of these six points has a, a short paragraph below which uh, tells you a little detail and then we move on to the life forms again we've got our humans our dwarves our elves but now we add tortons and goblins to the mix now the humans dwarves and elves each have a paragraph and when you choose one of these uh, life forms you get to choose um, from uh, your core motivation for each of these races so for example with dwarf you can choose expansion service plunder or envoy so yeah we got our three races but you notice that the hill folk are no longer in here uh, nor are the um, the small folk are hobbit types. So does that mean that these races cease to be? Well, I would say as these are mods, then you can still use your um, races from the core book. And I would certainly still want uh, small folk in there because people love playing those hobbitses. But then we add our tortons and our goblins. Now, goblins are the newest warrior queen of Thusm um, and they are very similar to goblins um, you can choose a knight a gun priest a royal errand or a wall scholar and our tortons are our teenage, teenage newton ninja turtles they're sort of turtles from space that um, are motivated by the way a stargazer an apprentice or proctor and i can see how these are going to be the two new races will be enjoyed by players and it adds to these of Mistos of Alfheim. The uh, classes have in the uh, core book uh, are now modded with character types. And we have a warrior, a master of steel who can take a beating. We have a hunter who is a marksman with a knack of, for survival. We have a shadow, a master of stealth and subterfuge. My, one of my face-to-face -face places could love this. A bard, an inspiring and devious tale teller. We have a mage, a collector and conduit of arcane secrets. And we have a priest, a righteous avatar of divine might. And one thing that has, uh, with the changes or the modifications and the quick start now, each one of these, um, classes now as well as your starting loot and your master abilities now has a starting ability and you get to choose one of your starting abilities so for example the hunter can be a quick draw a dead eye or a trap expert and i would say that these uh, starting abilities then you can also look at yourself having a look at the core book and if you want to keep those nine core classes or use some of those core classes with these new ones, then you will do need to do a little bit of work to get your starting ability. All you need is three abilities. Players can choose one of them. And then the other thing that um, the... Then at the bottom, we have our mastery. Now, mastery in second edition quick start is whenever you roll a natural 20, you mark up a point of mastery. And then when you've got... Is it 10 points or 20 points of mastery? Then you can pick one of these mastery abilities. So for example, the priest has a, cho a choice of elemental, healer, or monk. So if you want to use the core classes, then you're going to have to work out your masteries and abilities. It's not too much work, but it's something that you've got to do uh, to, to do the conversion across. Now, in the original core book, we had our fantasy equipment and our fantasy weapons, which were your generic scimitars, longsword, crossbow, that sort of thing. Uh, in the second edition quick start, we've now um, got 
specific Alfheim basic loot. You, and you've got, it's been sort of cut down, um, the weapons and the equipment. If anything, it's probably, um, he has simplified it and probably fitted it in with sort of the theme of the uh, Alfheim. So, for example, you've got something like a, a polar pack, which is a fur lined pack with a warm seal skin coat, contains a fire pot, fur mitten, snow, blind goggles, ski poles, boots, and rope. And as for the weapons, you've got things like a sword and scabbard, a great sword, a knight's weapon kit, uh, exotic weaponry. Yes, it can change the way Alfheim, the Alfheim setting is, but what I would say, and what some people don't seem to get the grasp of, the Quick Start 2 is not a direct replacement of Core. They are all mods. So if what you, what I would suggest is you have a look through this and incorporate some of it into your game if you want to. If you want to take it wholesale, then go and do so. But um, it's up to you to customize your game. And the whole of the setting uh, of the World Primers is all about uh, seeds for ideas and for you as the GM and the players to really customize the setting for yourself. So you can make the game that you want, the setting that you want. Um, and I really do enjoy the way that Hank does this. So that is Alfine, the fantasy setting. And then in the future episodes, I'm going to look at some of the other core settings. So that's all for this episode. If you want a, to contact me, you can leave a message via the Anchor app. If you check out the web page at petejones.neocities.org, that gives all the links to the podcast um, and the stuff I've done. And you can also contact me via the social media. And the email address is Dragons are real podcast at pm.me. That's all for this episode and I'll see you all on the flip side.